Hey guys, Carlson back to finish up Unit 8 with you, which covers Chapter 13, The Blood Vessels and Circulation. Now some of this information will kind of be reviewed, but we're going to get into much more detail about the vessels that carry blood to our peripheral tissues. We're also going to talk more about the nature of exchange that occurs between the blood and interstitial fluids. So we're going to start off with Section 1, which covers the different types of vessels and how they differ in size, structure, and function. We know that blood leaves the heart through the pulmonary trunk and aorta with a diameter of approximately 2.5 centimeters. Uh, from these vessels, they branch to form the major arteries that distribute blood to the body organs. Then you have more branching from there that creates your tiny arteries or arterioles, and then even smaller, your capillaries. Now the vital functions of the cardiovascular system occur at the capillary level because they're responsible for gas exchange between the fluids and the blood and then the tissues are going to rely on diffusion to receive nutrients and oxygen and remove waste products. So out of that capillary network, um, blood is going to flow first to the venules, the smallest vessels of the venous system. Venules are going to merge to form smaller veins and those are going to pass through medium sized and large veins to reach the systemic. Uh, system or your vena cavae, uh, which remember is this system here, we've seen this picture before, or they could reach the pulmonary veins in the pulmonary circuit, which is this circuit here that obviously reaches the lungs. Now, <clears throat> we're going to talk more about the structure of both veins and arteries, of their walls specifically, and there are three distinct layers. The tunica intima, which is the innermost layer dominated by uh, elastic fibers. You have your tunica media, which is a middle layer, which is always usually uh, made up of primarily some kind of muscle tissue, in this case smooth. And then your tunica externa, which is your outermost layer, and it forms a sheath of connective tissue uh, along with collagen fibers that intertwine with adjacent tissues to stabilize the artery or vein uh, where it needs to be. Now you can see here that the arteries are much thicker than our veins. Um, and this is because they need to handle the pressure that's generated by the heart as it forces blood into the arterial network. Now, due to stimulation, two things can happen within the blood vessel walls. You can have vasoconstriction, which uh, is when stimulated, it causes the muscles in the vessel walls to decrease in diameter, constricting or reducing blood flow. And then the opposite would be vasodilation, is when a stimulus causes the vessel walls to increase in diameter or relax, that would increase blood flow. And this would happen in response to different situations that could arise within the cardiovascular system. Now, our arteries. From the heart to the capillaries, the blood will travel through first elastic arteries, which are large and extremely resilient, like our pulmonary trunk and our aorta. Then your muscular arteries that are medium sized, they distribute blood to the skeletal muscles and internal organs. A good example would be the external carotid arteries in the neck. And then finally to our arterioles, which are much smaller than the muscular arteries. They have the ability to alter blood pressure and the rate of flow to dependent tissues. Now those arteries are going to branch off into capillaries, which again are the only blood vessels whose walls permit exchange between the blood and surrounding interstitial fluid. Their walls are thin, which allows for short diffusion rates and quicker exchange. They have a small diameter that slows the blood to give sufficient time for diffusion or active transport. And they have no tunica media or externa, um, so they're very, very small with an average diameter of 8 micrometers. They cannot function individually. You have to have a capillary bed, which is just an interconnected network of dozens of capillaries that stem from a single arteriole, and I'll show you a picture here shortly. Okay, now our veins are going to collect blood from all our tissues and then return it back to the heart, and they're classified on internal diameter. Uh, so our venules are the smallest. They resemble expanded capillaries, while our medium-sized veins range from 2 to 9 millimeters. Our large veins include the two vena cavae and their tributaries into the abdominal, pelvic, and thoracic cavities. They have thin walls because they don't need to withstand with much pressure, and they, they're so low in pressure that they cannot overcome gravity. So they do contain valves in the lower limbs that prevent backflow of blood by responding to body movement with pushing blood back towards the heart. However, if those valves are damaged, they can cause pooling, which is actually what leads to what we call varicose veins. Now, here is a picture of the organization of the capillary bed. So you have your arteriole that branches off into all of these capillaries, and those capillaries connect with those small venules to return the blood back to the heart. All right, 13.2 talks about pressure and resistance, which determines blood flow and the affects the rate of capillary change. So the primary function, again, of the cardiovascular system is to maintain an adequate blood flow through capillaries and all tissues of the body. So under normal circumstances, blood flow equals the cardiac output. The flow of the blood through the capillaries also depends on pressure and resistance. So pressure, 
um, occurs because liquids cannot be compressed. They're actually going to uh, create a gradient, so a high to low blood flow. Um, flow and pressure are directly related, so if you increase flow, you increase pressure and vice versa. Uh, forces generate hydrostatic pressure. Again, that is what causes that flow from high to low areas. Uh, the largest pressure gradient, or what we call circulatory pressure, is found in the systemic circuit at the base of the aorta and entrance to the right atrium. Uh, this is needed to force blood through the arterioles into the capillaries, and there are three components, arterial or blood pressure, capillary pressure, and venous pressure. Resistance is any force that opposes movement, and blood flow and resistance are indirectly related, so increased blood flow is going to decrease resistance and vice versa. Um, for blood to flow, the blood pressure must be great enough to overcome the total peripheral resistance or the entire uh, cardiovascular system. The greatest pressure difference is going to be in the arterial network, and we'll kind of talk more about these two things in class. Now, 13.3 is going to cover cardiovascular regulation uh, with autoregulation, neural mechanisms, and endocrine responses. Um, and so these are our homeostatic mechanisms, and they regulate cardiovascular activity to ensure the tissue blood flow or tissue perfusion is met. Um, and there are three factors that can affect this, cardiac output, peripheral resistance, and blood pressure. And when cells become active, the demands for these nutrients um, become, uh, they change. So they increase with more activity, decrease with less activity. And so homeostatic mechanisms are going to ensure timing, location, and gradual changes occur to make sure those demands are met. Here is a diagram of your short and long-term cardiovascular responses. And so autoregulation is going to start up here. If we have homeostasis is disturbed by physical stress, chemical changes, or increased tissue activity, inadequate local blood pressure and blood flow, um, you're going to have local decrease in resistance and increase in blood flow. And we're going to go down here if autoregulation is ineffective, um, which puts into play our neural and hormonal mechanisms. And so we can go down here to our brain for the neural or hormonal, we can go into the endocrine me mechanisms. And we're going to talk about these more in a second. But each of these three things are trying to restore homeostasis, which in this case is normal blood pressure and volume. So neural control includes baroreceptors, which monitor the degree of stretch in the walls of expandable organs. They're located in the aortic and carotid sinuses. The reflexes are going to adjust cardiac output and peripheral resistance to maintain normal blood pressure. Chemoreceptor reflexes respond to changes in carbon dioxide, oxygen, or pH. And their receptors are sensory neurons found in the aortic and carotid bodies. Our hormones and cardiovascular regulation are involved with the endocrine system. They provide both short and long-term uh, responses. The short term is going to put epinephrine and norepinephrine into play to stimulate cardiac output and peripheral vasoconstriction, while long term involves ADH, angiotensin II, and uh, urethropoietin and ANP, uh, which is shown in the next two diagrams here. So if we have a decrease in blood pressure and volume, homeostasis will be disturbed. There is a short-term effect that's controlled by our sympathetic activation, and they'll release that epinephrine and norepinephrine to increase cardiac output and peripheral vasoconstriction. Um, but we can also go into the endocrine response, which involves uh, angiotensin II, erythropoietin. That's going to increase our red blood cell formation, which increases uh, red blood cell volume. And along with angiotensin II, it's going to increase blood pressure and again, help to restore um, blood pressure and volume to its normal rates. Now, if we have an increase in um, blood pressure and volume, A and P is gonna come into play, and it's gonna increase sodium lost in urine, increase water loss in urine, reduce thirst, inhibition of ADH, aldosterone, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, and peripheral vasodilation. This will reduce blood volume to restore homeostasis. All right, 13.4 uh, is going to talk about how we adapt to physiological stress. One of those stresses is exercise. And so during exercise, we're going to have extensive vasodilation. Uh, venous return is going to increase, and cardiac output is going to rise as a result of increased venous return. And this has to do with that Frank Starling principle. Um, more blood in, more blood needs to go out. Now, um, cardiovascular responses to hemorrhage. This is when clotting responses fail to prevent a significant blood lo loss and uh, our blood pressure falls. The entire system is going to make adjustments. The short term is restoration of cardiac output levels by mobilize mobilizing a venous reserve. These are large reservoirs of venous blood in the liver, bone marrow, and skin. 
Uh, substantial loss will also increase the heart rate and the sympathetic activation assists by constricting the muscular arteries and arterioles to elevate blood pressure. Now, the long term is going to take ADH and aldosterone to promote fluid retention and reabsorption at the kidneys. Uh, thirst is going to increase to aid in fluid absorption in the digestive tract to replace borrowed interstitial fluids. And then urethropoietin is going to increase red blood cell production. Uh, 13.5 reviews our pulmonary and systemic circuits, and there are three general functional patterns within them. Um, but go ahead and jot down these notes to remind you about the difference between the pulmonary and systemic circuit, where they start and end, and also what their job is specifically. And the three functional patterns of the blood vessels include the distribution of arteries and veins on the left and right side of the bodies are usually identical except near the heart. A single vessel may undergo several name changes as it moves through the anatomical boundaries and tissues and organs are usually serviced by several arteries and veins. Um, this is an overview of the circulation pattern. Again, if you want to draw this to kind of help uh, visualize the circulation pattern, you're more than welcome to. Um, finally, 13.9 talks about how aging affects the blood, heart, and blood vessels. I'm just going to walk through the slides. You can jot down the effects. But it talks about the capabilities of the cardiovascular system to um, adjust to changes. And so the major changes affect all parts of the system, which are the blood, heart, and vessels. So each net of these next slides are going to talk about the effects on blood first here. Then we have the heart. And then your blood vessels. So I will pause at each of these slides and jot down the effects of each one. The last thing you need to do is uh, 1310 shows you the structural and functional links to all the other systems with the cardiovascular system. So jot down some notes of that system integrator on page 467 and then you will be done. And I'll see you guys next time.